All right, guys, how's it going? I've always been a huge fan of Star Trek, including the original series, which my dad and I used to watch together when I was a boy. These were repeats, obviously. I'm not quite this old. And 17 years ago, I received something related to that, which would change the way that I looked at life and death. It was Christmas 2002, and as part of my present from my sister, I received this book. I'm Working on That by William Shatner. It was a thoughtful gift, like most gifts from my sister. She knew I was a huge fan of Star Trek, Shatner, and just technology in general. And I'm Working on That took us on a trek from science fiction to science fact, discussing how certain Star Trek technologies were becoming reality while also offering a glimpse into possible futures. But one part of the book in particular stood out to me. And forgive me any errors here as I am going on memory. I haven't actually read the book in 17 years. But it was when Shatner was talking to someone about the constant increase in computing power and asked them, when would we finally have enough computation in a home computer to rival the human brain? Both Shatner and myself were somewhat surprised by the very specific answer of 2029. Remember, this was back in 2002. The book can still be bought on Amazon today. It's a little bit expensive though for now, but I might pick it up if I get one a bit cheaper. But anyway, after I finished reading I'm Working On That, I started searching for more material on how technology might change the future. The idea that we were catapulting inexorably forward to a point in time when we'd have personal computers superseding human brain power was extremely seductive to me. But in 2002, the internet wasn't really anywhere near as huge as it is today. Around 550 million users, which is around about 9% of the world population. Compare that to the 4.5 billion today, and nearly 60% are humans using the internet. But back in 2002, Wikipedia had only been around for one year, and it had far fewer articles, especially those that were in far-out topics like the kind I was searching for. So my search for more material failed somewhat, and I just forgot about it for a little while. But every so often, when I was bored or hankering for something new to read, I always came back to this topic of future studies. It just never left me. But it would be 2005 before I finally found what I was looking for. I first heard of the term accelerating change when reading through Wiki one night. And I would often do that. I'd start off in some topic and then I would just let myself go down the rabbit hole, ending up in all sorts of wonderlands. So what is accelerating change? According to the Wikipedia article, in future studies and the history of technology, accelerating change is a perceived increase in the rate of technological change throughout history. Rate being the important word there, which may suggest faster and more profound change in the future and may or may not be accompanied by equally profound social and cultural change. In the early part of the 1900s, a few scientists, architects and polymaths, guys like Buckminster Fuller here, and the genius von Neumann here, began to realise that not only were we obviously progressing technologically, but the rate of progression was apparently speeding up as well. Buckminster Fuller often used the word ephemeralization, which essentially means progressively accomplishing more with less. A gradually smaller and smaller amount of materials and effort will accomplish more and more useful functions. We get better and better at using materials in more sophisticated ways, so we need less and less quantity of materials. Perhaps the most obvious example of that would be transport, where it took Ferdinand Magellan two years to sail around the planet in a wooden sailing ship in 1520. Yet 350 years later, it took a steel steamship two months to do the same trip. Only 75 years later, a plane, made of metal alloys this time, took two weeks to fly around the planet. And only 35 years after that, a space capsule made of exotic metals takes only one hour to circle the planet. Continuously, the materials used get lighter and stronger and more versatile. It may also be worth noting here that in the previous circa 10,000 years of domesticated humanity, we weren't able to circumnavigate the globe at all. If you imagine that on a scale starting in, say, 8,500 BC and then now, it might look something like this. 
This green line where nothing much appears to happen for a very long time before suddenly reaching a critical point of explosive growth which overtakes both linear, the red, and cubic, which is the blue growth. And after it overtakes both, it pulls away at a dramatic rate. And that is known as exponential growth. Another example of ephemeralization would be the internet, where certain costs of doing business is effectively nothing compared to brick and mortar stores. Email replaced snail mail. Again, we're talking essentially free and instant messaging, which replaced a delivery day, at least, and a cost. So not only can we do more with less, the rate of doing more with lessness is increasing. There is an acceleration taking place. Perhaps now though, in what is almost the year 2020, we can look back at the 1970s space capsule and ask where the improvement on that has been over the past 50 years. But I'll touch again on that point later on. Following accelerating change came the popularisation of another, more famous future studies concept called the technological singularity. This one was mostly the doing of mathematician and fiction author Werner Vinge, who argued in his 1993 essay, The Coming Technological Singularity, that the creation of superhuman artificial intelligence will mark the point at which the human era will be ended, such that no current models of reality are sufficient to predict beyond it. Even more famous than Vinge on the technological singularity concept is the author and inventor Ray Kurzweil, whose famous 2005 book, The Singularity is Near, expanded on his Law of Accelerating Returns concept, which he introduced in his earlier 1999 book, The Age of Spiritual Machines. As technology enthusiasts, we of course all know about Gordon Moore, whose 1965 research paper described a doubling every year in the number of components in an integrated circuit. Moore had originally projected that this doubling every year rate of growth would continue for at least another decade. In 1975, that was revised to doubling every two years for the next decade. This became known famously as Moore's Law and is the standard means of explaining technological progression even today. But perhaps it's more famous today for the phrase Moore's Law is dead or Moore's Law is dying. But that's something I'll touch on later. Kurzweil, in his Singularity is Near, extended Moore's law backwards to pre-integrated circuit days. And he showed that the rate of computing progression, what he referred to as the number of calculations per second per $1,000, has always been increasing exponentially. And just before the turn of the 21st century, we were still in the era of single core CPUs running a few hundred megahertz. So that's likely where this 10 to the power of 8, around about 100 million calculations per second comes from. And looking back to the transistor era, between the 60s and 70s, this number was 10 to the power of 2, 100 calculations per second. And before the transistor was a vacuum tube with capability of around 10 calculations per second per $1,000. Relays were previous to those down at 0 0.01. And before that was the era of punch cards or tabulating machines. The difference in computation over those 100 years between 1900 and 2000 is absolutely massive. Mostly though brought around by fundamental changes in the technology. But again though, you might notice that just as with our example with travel, which appeared to peak at the space shuttle, something else here appeared to put the brakes on around about 1970. And we've been stuck on integrated silicon circuits for around 50 years now. But unlike with the globe circumnavigating travel methods, computing performance has continued to grow during the integrated circuit era. I found this timeline of instructions per second over at Wiki as well. I thought this was pretty interesting. If we go back to 1978 and the Intel 8086, we have this instructions per clock cycle and the 8086 has a value of 0.066. If we now fast forward to 1999, and the Intel Pentium 3, we're now at 3.4 instructions per clock cycle. Compared to 1978, that is a speed up of 51.5x in 21 years. From the Pentium 3's 3.4 instructions per clock cycle in 1999, 
we improved to 28 instructions per clock cycle, which is a speed up of 8x with the Core i7-920 released in 2008. Much of this increase of course came from the fact that we now had 4 cores and 8 threads instead of just the single core on the Pentium 3. But what about since 2008? Something I talk about an awful lot is, due to the lack of competition, Intel were able to milk quad cores for almost a decade. And we can also see the results of that in this table. With the Core i7-920, we had 28, I'm just going to call it IPCC from now on. In 2011, with the 2600K, that had increased to 34.5 IPCC. In 2012, we actually saw a regression down to 27 IPCC with the i7-3770K. And in 2013, we were back up to just over 34 IPCC with the Haswell i7-4770K. Between 2008 and 2013 was five whole years of very little growth simply because we were stuck on quad cores. And in fact, this continued all the way until 2017 when the final high-end quad core, the i7-7700K, was released. And on numerous occasions, I believe most notably by Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen, this slowdown in computing progress was cited as one major reason why the singularity isn't near. But the fact is, this was never a technical decision by Intel, it was a financial decision. And to be fair, there are also a couple of Extreme Edition chips in there. The 980X was around in 2010, and there's the 3960X in 2011. But these Extreme Editions had some fairly extreme pricing as well. Certainly, the number of instructions per clock cycle per dollar hadn't improved that much in years. But Intel did finally break that 100 IPCC mark. And that was in 2016, with the 10-core i7-6950X, which cost $1,700. And things were looking pretty bad until finally, in 2017, after years in the wilderness, AMD finally got their act together again. The Ryzen 7 1800X, that came in slightly below the 6950X's mark at only 85 IPCC. But the 1800X was an 8-core chip and cost less than one-third of the 6950X. So the performance per dollar factor was at least getting back on track. And less than a week ago, the Ryzen 9 3950X launched at $750. A 16-core consumer-grade CPU, which on this very large IPCC table, based on the Ryzen 7 1800X's score, should score around about the 200 IPCC mark. It's got double the cores, it's got faster clock speed, it's got better IPC. So, in the 20 years since the Pentium 3 launched in 1999, the speed up in terms of raw IPCC has been around about 59x. Remember, the Pentium 3 was 3.4 IPCC, 1999, and in 2019, this 3950X should be around the 200 mark. So there is still an improvement there, and that was brought around through an increase in CPU core counts and clock speeds, even though Moore's Law is slowing down. It makes you wonder though, had Intel not milked quad cores for a decade? Who knows where we'd be today? Perhaps progression will accelerate as both Intel and AMD appear to have rejoined battle again and they are both going all in on exascale computing. They keep on finding new methods that keep Moore's Law alive. Moore's Law now means something different from what it started out as, but the underlying concept of more performance at a cheaper price that really hasn't changed. But how sustainable is even this? Today we are clearly at a silicon clock wall around about 5 GHz. So with current materials, the only realistic way to increase computation today is through increasing core counts, which is also a software problem to fully utilise all those extra cores. But that's for classical computing. Since the early 2010s, there's been a GPU revolution. And now NVIDIA GPUs are apparently keeping this calculations per second per constant dollar trend going. And it's not because NVIDIA GPUs are cheap, I can assure you about that. We are living in an AI revolution and GPUs aren't even the best fit for it. So we should expect this growth to continue for some time. But to what end? For some, including Vinji and Kurzweil, 
All of this ends in the aforementioned technological singularity. I talked briefly about exponential growth using the example of Magellan's expedition to space flight. Kurzweil believes that we are currently, and in fact always have been, in an exponential growth pattern, which has led us inexorably to this point and to a future where our technology has progressed so far and so quickly that humanity, as we currently know it, could not even begin to comprehend. Looking at this countdown to singularity slide from The Singularity Is Near, and we can see that for the vast majority of life, that life was single cellular organisms from around about the 3.6 billion year mark up until about 1.2 billion years ago. Then seemingly out of nowhere came eukaryotes, which spawned body plans during the Cambrian explosion, which then led to reptiles, mammals, primates, to eventually humans, homo sapiens, which we believed evolved only around 350,000 years ago. 350,000 years is a mere drop in the vast ocean of time that the Earth has existed. It is about one ten thousandth of the time. Yet since that point 350,000 years ago, humans have colonised near the entirety of the planet and developed technologies that can put us in space. And in fact, out of that 350,000 years, we only really colonised Earth in the past few hundred years. And as I noted earlier, we only got into space during the past 50 to 60 years. 50 years out of 3.6 billion years of life is a vanishingly small fraction. A couple of times in this video, I've used the word inexorably, which means in a way that is impossible to stop or prevent. And all of this was set in motion from the evolution of eukaryotes, which brought diversity to life, plants, fungi, animals, which was only ever going to end up in the Cambrian explosion through evolution. As soon as body parts existed, all the various forms of life were certain to exist too. That is just evolution for you. Of course, the dinosaurs got wiped out at the top of their power in the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, which led to mammalian domination, which in turn led to primates and then humans coming to dominate the planet. Had the dinosaurs not been wiped out by that massive asteroid? Who knows, that's a different video entirely. But when humans settled down, started building cities, developed agriculture, invented writing, the writing was by then on the wall for all other species on Earth, the printing press created another explosion, this time an explosion in ideas, as never before had the research of others been so readily accessible to so many. Soon afterwards, the Industrial Revolution brought manufacture to unheard of levels of scale. The Industrial Revolution alone could be called a singularity of sorts. It was a single time in history which completely revolutionised the whole world. And that was rapidly followed by electricity. If somebody asks me what the most important breakthrough in history is, I'll often say it was our ability to harness and produce electricity. Imagine a world without it. Did you? In that world, there would have been no telephone, no TV, no radio, no computers, not even any of the equipment to make any of those inventions possible. Fundamentally, all of this happened due to the power of ideas. It's about people being brought together and exchanging ideas. The reason why we hardly progressed between 6000 BC and 1500 AD was because the world was still a dark and relatively empty place. Now, of course, there were many more humans on Earth in 1500 AD compared to 6000 BC, but we were still so spread out and so disconnected from each other that we had no real progression. Yes, various forms of writing had been developed long since. However, all the great minds were spread out in various cities throughout the Middle East, Asia and Europe. The exchange of ideas was still slow and difficult. I mentioned earlier how I couldn't get the information I wanted on future topics. And that was only 15 to 20 years ago. Now, I can get information on absolutely anything I want. I can get instant access to research papers written up by scientists all around the globe. Well, not quite free, as you do have to pay for some papers. There are ways to get them free, however, and many people believe access to research like this should be free. The point is, the exchange of ideas has never been quicker or easier than it is today. If you're in the same field, you can connect with almost any researcher in an instant. 
If you're under 30 years old, and certainly under 20, you may be thinking, yeah, so what? Point is, all of this is relatively new. Before the advent of the internet, we simply didn't have this level of access. And even if we had had it, the type of work that some of you are doing today simply wouldn't have been possible anyway, because we didn't have the computing power to get the job done in a reasonable time frame. All kinds of scientific advancement on Earth are growing exponentially due to the sharing of ideas. And one of the things about exponential growth is that we may not realise we are in it, or we are just about to enter the explosive phase. At the knee of the curve here. And that's because we're living in it, and this all seems normal to us. I've got a pretty good memory though, and believe me, in nearly all walks of life, the difference between the years 2000 and 2020 is very large. The difference between 2020 and 2030 is likely to be even larger than that. 2020 to 2040? It could well look like magic. But will that really be the case? Has humanity peaked? Does this exchange of ideas even matter any longer? Haven't we hit some fundamental level, limited by our own brain power? This explosion in connectivity and the explosion in the sharing of ideas is already far beyond saturation point, surely? No human being can possibly learn the entirety of what's on the internet today. Not even a tiny, tiny fraction of it. But an AI could. Guys like Kurzweil, Vinge and others believe that the technological singularity will likely kick off with advances in artificial intelligence. And nanotechnology is often cited as well. In particular, nanorobots. Regarding AI though, the theory goes that, as discussed at the top of the video, Computation will have reached one human brain power around about some point in the 2020s. One major difference to when I read I'm working on that though, is that back then this human brain power level was based on what we believed would be CPU performance. As it happens though, CPUs are not particularly good at mimicking the human brain. The human brain is actually quite a slow but massively parallel machine. CPUs are generally the opposite. They are fast and low threaded. GPUs on the other hand, do parallelization particularly well. Though as I mentioned earlier, they're still likely not the best method for progressing AI. NVIDIA GPUs are at the top of this updated 120 years of Moore's Law slide because they are more readily available today. And NVIDIA also has a great software ecosystem behind them. But what happens when we finally reach that point of human level general intelligence in an AI? Presumably, as computing performance continues to advance at a rapid pace, the AI continues to advance at a rapid pace. So it'll be smarter than von Neumann was. What's more, as it's already smarter than the smartest of humans, it'll be smart enough to improve itself far faster than any human could, or even any collection of the smartest humans ever seen on Earth could. And soon, it will be smarter than all the humans on Earth combined. Essentially, what we're talking about here is a super AI with access to the entirety of human knowledge on the internet and the ability to recursively self-improve. It's got all the massive paralyzation of the human brain, but instead of having organic neurons limited to a couple of hundred hertz, that's about how fast a neuron fires in a human brain. It's running at multiple gigahertz. Or by this point in the mid 2040s, it's more likely to be terahertz or petahertz. An AI this smart would soon be like a god to us and humanity would never be the same again. And that is the technological singularity. And there are a lot of smart people trying to bring it about. And I know some of you are thinking, oh, come on, Jim. All I'm seeing here is a bunch of wishful thinking, pseudoscience and science fiction writers with too much time on their hands. We've seen with the slowdown in the 70s that travel has basically peaked. We've seen evidence of computation performance, if not exactly peaking, then perhaps decelerating, at least with CPUs. But there are people out there who are in a position to make a difference. There are few more famous and influential microprocessor engineers than Jim Keller. Most famous for designing AMD's K8 and Zen microarchitectures, he also worked on Apple A4 and A5. After leaving AMD, he was at Tesla for a time, before he moved on again to where he currently is at Intel. In an interview with Ian Curtis of Anantech in July last year, Jim mentioned not once, but twice, Ray Kurzweil. 
I think about the future, obviously, because my favourite quote from Ray Kurzweil is, people think the next 25 years is going to look like the last 25 years, but the future accelerates. And so the next 10 years of computing is going to be kind of wild. And then later, again, Ray Kurzweil has a graphic of computer performance, I think from 1870 to today, which is log linear. So when some people ask me where I think the future is going, well, I think it's been a log linear scale for 100 years. Now it's 104 years. So what do you think is going to happen next? I think it's going to go on for a while. And then later on, in August, over at Venture Beat, Keller again mentioned Kurzweil. I like Ray Kurzweil's line that the future is the future accelerating. The next 25 years will be bigger than the last 25. The AI revolution is really big. And it was around about this time that I realised Jim Keller, one of the greatest microprocessor architects of all time, is likely chasing the singularity as well. However, he is doing it on a completely different level. And in fact, only a couple of months ago, he held this presentation. Moore's law is not dead. And again, he multiple times referenced Kurzweil's The Singularity is Near, using both Kurzweil's law and his law of accelerating returns. And clearly Jim believes that AI will be a major factor in moving things forward to the next level. My main problem here? We already know that Intel has been guilty of harming progression and acting anti-competitively. I mean, sure, it was different people and at a different time. And to be fair, with Apple sitting on billions of dollars doing nothing with it, and even AMD today are showing signs of making bank, I have to wonder if any of these companies are deserving of this man's talents. But if it's not at these companies, which companies would it be at? That question? Well, let me get on with the final part of this video and also get back to the point on us creating this super AI god. Assuming it is possible, and I see no reason why it won't be one day, what if our super AI turns out to be an evil AI? Many eminent scientists and engineers have voiced this concern, including Stephen Hawking, who also strongly believed that there is no fundamental difference between what the human brain and what a computer can achieve. One of the more famous critics of AI today is Elon Musk, founder and CEO of SpaceX, co-founder and CEO of Tesla, co-founder of Neuralink, which is a very interesting company from a future studies perspective. And in fact, Musk has his finger in a lot of pies, most of which seem to be linked to the singularity in some fashion. He has long spoken out on his concerns over AI as well, fearing that indeed, we are moving ahead too fast in ways that we don't fully understand yet. Just a couple of months ago, again, he issued an AI warning stating that computers will surpass us in every single way and we will be far, far surpassed in every single way. I guarantee it. Musk is also known for wanting us to get off this rock and away to Mars, apparently as a means to guarantee the safety of humanity in the event that this extremely smart computer AI does end up evil. However, from my perspective, I just don't see how that would deter an incredibly smart and evil AI, assuming that it cared enough to dominate the Martian humans too. And if you're evil enough, then why the hell not? On that topic of space travel though, and I had noted that since the 70s, that hasn't really taken very many steps forward. In this case, I believe that's been down to two things, which are basically cost and will. When the race to space was won by the Russians, and then the race to the moon was won by the USA, there wasn't a whole lot else that needed to be done politically at that point. In fact, as the USA continued to send more men to the moon to play golf, more American taxpayers asked what the point of it was. This stuff was really expensive back then. The major difference in space travel today though is the reduction in cost. And much of that is due to SpaceX's extremely aggressive pricing. I remember reading this interview with Musk over at Air and Space. This was back in January 2012. And back then, a SpaceX launch would cost an average of $57 million. At that same time, Boeing and Lockheed Martin, producers of the Delta and the Atlas rockets, they didn't have public prices at that point. But budget documents from 2010 showed that three rocket launches for them cost an average of $380 million per launch. And at the same time, Musk actually claimed that their performance would increase and their prices would decline over time. 
Noting that SpaceX's approach to rocket design stems from one core principle. Simplicity enables both reliability and low cost. Also notable in this interview was the following paragraph where Musk claimed a lot of the reason for Boeing and Lockheed Martin's pricing is due to the government's traditional cost plus contracting system, which ensures that manufacturers make a profit even if they exceed their advertised prices. If you were sitting at an executive meeting at Boeing and Lockheed and you came up with some brilliant idea to reduce the cost of Atlas or Delta, you'd be fired because you've got to go report to your shareholders why you made less money. Their incentive is to maximise the cost of the vehicle right up to the threshold of cancellation. The difference between these old corporations like Intel, Apple and AMD and a lot of what Musk is doing is the former are all publicly traded stocks who have these shareholders to report to. SpaceX, Neuralink, his other company, The Boring Company, are all privately held. He is calling the shots, and it's clear to me at least that it's not about money for him. At worst, it's not just about the money. He knows that real progression requires cost cutting. And this is where I'd much rather see guys like Jim Keller be. Whether or not Musk is chasing the singularity, or trying to stop it though, I'm not yet sure. However, he appears to be resigned to it happening in some fashion. I'll go off on a bit of a tangent here though and talk about something else that Musk is often heard discussing, simulated reality. The concept of simulated reality is perhaps best known today due to Nick Bostrom's simulation argument. In 2003, he proposed a trilemma, arguing that one of three unlikely seeming propositions is almost certainly true. Number one was, the fraction of human-level civilizations that reach a post-human stage, that is, one capable of running high-fidelity simulations of universes, is very close to zero. Or, the fraction of post-human civilizations that are interested in running simulations of a universe is very close to zero. And finally, the fraction of people with our kind of experiences that are living in a simulation is very close to one. I've just spent a long time showing how technology has been progressing and how we should believe it will continue to progress. If that is the case, as seems likely, then at some point in the future, be that 20 years from now, 100 years, a thousand years, even a million years from now, which note, in cosmological timescales, a million years is still nothing. At some point in the future, we will have vast quantities of computational power by far and away exceeding what we have access to today. And at that point, the ability to run simulations of existences should pose no problems to us. Of course, the universe, assuming it's real and not a simulation of one, is nearly 14 billion years old, while the Earth is like 5 billion years old. And given how vast the universe is, there really ought to have been many, many alien species who reached this point of having access to vast quantities of computational power. And therefore, there should have been many, many alien species with the ability to run any number of simulations of existence. Bostrom's argument can be simplified as either we are living in a simulation of reality right now, which could have been created by aliens or even ourselves, or we will wipe ourselves out before we reach the capability to create those simulations. Or we are alone in the universe. And now you know why I believe that aliens don't exist. If it is that last option, us being alone in the universe, then we are the ones destined to reach the singularity first. And we will almost certainly go on to create these simulations because we'll have so much processing power at our command. Of course, there may be nothing preventing us from reaching the singularity within a simulated universe. Maybe that's the point of the simulation. And you thought just the singularity was wacky enough, right? Musk, however, believes we are very likely to be living in a simulated reality. The chance we are not living in a computer simulation is one in billions. And he said that the strongest argument for us probably being in a simulation, I think, is the following. 40 years ago, we had Pong. Two rectangles and a dot. That's where we were. Now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously. And it's getting better every year. And soon we'll have virtual reality. We'll have augmented reality. 
if you assume any rate of improvement at all, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality. Just indistinguishable. There are a bunch of very smart guys, all with their own beliefs and agendas. Vinji and Coswell are convinced that the singularity is near. Jim Keller appears to be getting on with making it happen. I'm just not convinced until it's where he should be trying. Getting back together with Musk at, say, Neuralink though? That surely has to be to the benefit of both parties. Musk, of course, and Bostrom think that the odds are massively stacked in favour of us being Sims. And in Musk's case, that means he's concerned that inside of our simulation, we end up creating an evil super AI god who perhaps decides to torture us for all eternity. These are all very smart guys. 50 years ago, just thinking about any of this stuff would have had you locked up in a padded cell. Maybe that's why people decide to believe in religion instead? Putting faith in entities they've never seen and with no real evidence of existence. For me though, what this really all comes down to is the one thing. It's the promise of everlasting life, the end of death. When the singularity hits us, assuming the AI isn't hostile, it would only be mere days until we were having our minds uploaded to some everlasting cloud, essentially gaming immortality alongside of our new AI god. I'm quite sure that's a huge factor for Vinji's and Coswell's beliefs, and even Keller's. All these guys are getting on a bit, although Keller looks to be in pretty decent shape at least, and I'm no spring chicken either to be frank. Maybe that's why I believe in the singularity too. Whether it comes in the mid-2040s, as Coswell predicted, or whether it comes any time before it's too late for me to get uploaded, I don't know. I do however believe that the singularity must happen one day, even if it's a million years away. What about Musk's Neuralink though? Developing ultra-high bandwidth brain-machine interfaces to connect humans and computers. What do you think this is really all about? I also believe that Musk is correct insofar as we need to be very, very careful with where we're heading with AI. But do I believe we are living in a simulation? No, I don't. However, I do believe that it's possible and logically, the odds on that being the case could be quite high. Perhaps it's also a simulation that was created by an evil AI. That would certainly explain a lot to me, though I wonder how Elon would feel about it. And I know that most of this stuff sounds crazy to many of you, but the more you analyse it, the more logical it is. Mostly though, I'm just trying to make sense of what appears to be a few paradoxes in our universe, which has given me the impression that maybe all isn't quite what it appears to be. The lack of alien evidence in what seems to be a vast, almost infinite universe? There's something wrong there, and it's not our ability to detect aliens because if they were advanced enough aliens, then making themselves known to us would be elementary for them. Our technology level shouldn't matter. But to end this one back on Earth, as Jim Keller noted in his presentation, every time the fab guys say that the next node is getting too expensive, sure it starts off expensive, but costs can be driven down over a year. And it seems to happen every single time. We always find a way to keep Moore's Law going. In this case, I believe that it is our insatiable demand for compute and new products that drives the tech industry on further and further against all of the odds. What do you believe? But right, I'm done with this one. I've had this video in mind for years to be honest, but consider this very much an intro to the singularity and other future type topics, which you'll be seeing more of sporadically from me. AI is one that needs a proper look at obviously, but that will be a hell of a video. In the meantime, as always, check out the website by clicking on the button. There's been a slew of leaks, analysis and reviews as usual. And I'll be back with some interesting news pretty soon. In the meantime though, I'll catch you later guys.